Good morning in the heart of Jesus. As we walk the path with Jesus in these weeks preceding his Passion Week, we can imagine how his ministry was spreading, how excited the people were, and how on many occasions they must have walked long distances just to hear him speak. We have often been encouraged to study the Sermon on the Mount, and we may even consider that this sermon took place as one event. However, in the Lost Teachings of Jesus in Volume 1, we'd learn that the book of Matthew is 111 verses long, and Luke's Sermon on the Plain is only 30. So while both sermons contain the Beatitudes, Luke's sprinkles much of Matthew's other 81 verses in different contexts along in his gospel. In Matthew, the Lord's Prayer is within the sermon, but Luke puts it in a different section of his sermons. Scholars have concluded that the writers were working from source documents as they were weaving existing sayings and parables into an outline of Jesus' ministry. And it's highly unlikely that the evangelist put every saying, every parable, every act or sermon or teaching that Jesus ever, ever gave into these particular verses in the Bible that were included in the Bible. So it is highly probable that this set of teachings known as the Sermon on the Mount is composed of the teachings Jesus delivered in many places on many occasions when people gathered to hear him speak. So what did he say in the Sermon on the Mount for us today? It begins with the Beatitudes, which we recited together earlier in our service this morning. This is the part that many of us probably best remember about this sermon. However, if you read all of chapters 5 through 7, you'll find that Jesus taught about many other things as well. And according to our messenger, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, this is really a sermon on karma. Another author, Emmett Fox wrote a whole book on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, the Beatitudes are actually a prose poem in eight verses. It is practically a general summary of the whole Christian teaching. He said it is spiritual more than a literary synopsis, summarizing the spirit of the teaching rather than the letter, and is highly characteristic of the old oriental mode of the path of, food, of Buddhism and the Ten Commandments of Moses and other such really compact groupings of ideas. Fox writes, Jesus concerned himself exclusively with the teaching of general principles. And these general principles always had to do with mental states, with what we're thinking. For he knew that if one's mental states were, are, are right, and right with God, then everything else can be right with, with God also. Whereas if our mental states and our thinking are wrong, nothing else can be right. Now I think this is an interesting observation because all of us are probably more normally aware of the things that we say and do. And perhaps we need to pay more attention to what we're thinking about all day long. Fox says, unlike the other great religious teachers, Jesus gives us no detailed instructions about what we are to eat or to drink, or to refrain from eating or drinking certain things, or to carry out various ritual observances at certain times and seasons. Indeed, the whole current of his teaching is anti-ritualistic, anti-formalist. He had little patience at any time with the Jewish priesthood and its theory of salvation only through the temple observances, meaning the rules. For actually, Fox actually quotes Jesus saying, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. The hour is cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit. And in truth, 
for the Father seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so today, here we are, we're worshiping together as one, and yet we're not in a single temple, and we are not still at Jerusalem. We are benefiting from the magnificent technology that our beloved St. Germain has brought to us for the new age. We are worshiping worldwide and spreading the good news of universal and individual Christhood, our Christhood. Emmett Fox goes on to say the Pharisees, with their appalling code of outward detailed observances, meaning the rules, were the only people towards whom he was really intolerant. A conscientious Pharisee of those days, and most of them were extremely conscientious, according to their instructions, had an enormous number of outer details to attend to every single day before he could feel that he had satisfied the requirements of God. A modern rabbi has estimated the number of such details and rules at not less than 600. And as it is obvious that no human being could really carry out this sort of thing in daily practice, the natural result would be that the victim, conscious of falling far short of the accomplishment of his duties, must necessarily labor under a chronic sense of sin. Have you felt like that sometimes? You know, you have your list of things to do, and you get our prayers and our decrees done, we have jobs, we have families, we have shopping, we have all the things that are necessary to go about living a modern life. And everything doesn't get done in that day. And you may feel bad about it, or somehow less than what you think you're supposed to be and to do. Fox says, now to believe yourself to be sinful is for practical purposes to be sinful with all the consequences that follow upon that condition. The policy of Jesus contrasts with this in that his object is rather to wean the heart from relying upon the outer things at all, either for pleasurable gratification or for spiritual salvation and to inculcate a new attitude of mind altogether. And this policy is, gra is graphically set forth in the Beatitudes, which we recited earlier. You can go back and review these Beatitudes daily in your Bible or in Decree 60.15. And in the Bible, it's found in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 16. Jesus made a special point of discouraging a great emphasis on outer observances and hard and fast rules and regulations of every kind. Fox writes, what he insisted upon was a certain spirit in one's conduct, and he was careful to teach principles only, knowing that when the spirit is right, the details will take care of themselves, and that in fact the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life, as is as was seen so much so in the sad example that, that the Pharisees set forth. Yet in spite of this, this history of Orthodox Christianity is largely made up of attempts to enforce all sorts of external observances upon the people. One example of this is the Puritan attempt to enforce the Old Testament Sabbath upon Christians, even though this was really a uh, a, a purely Hebrew ordinance, the Sabbath law, and the ferocious penalties involved in neglecting it applied exclusively to the desecration of Saturday, in spite of the fact that Jesus particularly did those things that he needed or wanted to do on Saturday. He clearly indicates throughout his teaching that the time has come when man must make each and every day a spiritual Sabbath by knowing and doing all things in a spiritual light. So what does our messenger say about the Sermon on the Mount? Mother taught the entire sermon recorded in Matthew 5-7 through is Jesus' doctrine 
on the rewards for righteous and unrighteous conduct, karma. The Sermon on the Mount is a sermon on karma, she said. Go home and burn the midnight oil and read it tonight and read Jesus' words with a new enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. It is his teaching on the consequences of thoughts, feelings, words, and deeds. It's the greatest lesson on karma, she said, as the law of personal accountability for one's acts that you will find anywhere. So we see that mother enforces what Emmett Fox said about the mental states. What we think is creating our karma too. If the mental states are right, then other things can be right. Mastery of the emotional body requires mastery of our thoughts. We need to monitor our thoughts and then our feelings, not just our words or actions. Mother Mary also speaks of this sermon. She says, it is true, precious ones, that if past revelations had been heeded, today the virtue of living, of the living word of truth spoken between neighbor and neighbor would create a different complex in the world. It is true that the Sermon on the Mount spoken by my son embodies the highest teachings of Christly character. Yet the scriptures themselves declare and there are also many other things which Jesus did and said, to which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This shows clearly that much of his teachings have not been recorded. And I'm certain that you realize that all of his words were of equal import, she said. Hence, beloved ones, progressive revelation is for the purpose of continuing the infinite release of the word of God to men in each contemporary and succeeding generation. Not in refutation, meaning not in denial of the old, but as an affirmation of the ever new testament of God. Now let's turn to what Jesus said about his own sermon. He says, when I gave forth the teachings of the brotherhood that have been handed down as the Sermon on the Mount, I stress the need for the disciples to observe the laws on judgment and brotherhood. And if I were to address the multitudes on the hillsides of the world in this day and age, my sermon would be much the same. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And so, what do we see and hear in all of the media around us today? Listening to the news, it is perpetual judgment. Critics abound on every subject and hurl their personal judgments on everyone else and everything in our world. It would appear that we all might believe that we are professional critics. Mother teaches that Jesus affirmed the law of karma and reincarnation that is taught in the Old Testament. And yet many of the Christian churches have not acknowledged the record of this teaching. The denial of karma and reincarnation in Christianity today is a betrayal of the soul of every Christian, Jew, and Muslim, Mother says. She said it's not a question of mysteries. It's not a question of some arcane interpretation of the Bible. It's the exact words spoken by Jesus and his apostles as they gave us the law of karma and reincarnation. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill the law that is written in the Old Testament and the prophets who proclaimed it. And truly, it was the law of karma that he came to fulfill. He said, 
For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Mother expanded on this. She said, We must remember that the law of karma is the law of the causal relationship between a man's act and the universe's reaction to his acts that returns to his doorstep. This return of positive and negative karma continues daily, hourly, and forever until his soul is perfected in Christ and he escapes the rounds of reincarnation, which have their root in the karma of desire. If you want to move on with the universe, you are going to have to shoulder your karmic responsibilities and pay your debts to life. Yes, pay your debts now and pay them quickly. Pay them to anyone and everyone. Get right with people. Call them up and tell them you love them. Tell them you're sorry for something that you did or said to them 10 years ago or 30 years ago. Tell them you want to make things right with them. Then do something worthwhile for them or with them. Render a service. Bring them a special gift. that comes directly from your heart. How about starting with the greatest gift of all? The joy. The joy that is in your heart. Sometimes do you feel like there's no joy in your heart? That's what we need to find and to give. Give them the joy that is in your heart, which is the joy of the Lord that he has first given you so that you could Give it to others. It wasn't just given to us for us. It's given to us to pass on. Make peace with people so that when your time comes, you can rest in that peace. These are mother's words. And she said, pay as you go. And one day, sooner than you think, you will have fulfilled the last jot and tittle of your karma, and you will be free. And here is the real mystery. Although you will have balanced your karma and worked the works of him that sent you, although you will have taken full accountability for your actions, yet you will know that you have won your victory by the grace of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you will understand that it was because he saved your soul to reincarnate again and again that you did indeed return to finish the work the work of your karma, and the work of your dharma. In another section on the Sermon on the Mount, this is Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, we find the sayings of Jesus giving great emphasis by the Maha Chohan, who is the representative of the Holy Spirit. In the book of his teachings, the Maha Chohan's teachings, entitled The Opening of the Temple Doors, which is a series of dictations by the Maha Chohan. He teaches us this. I consider that one of the most important teachings that I can bring to you is a further explanation of Jesus' teaching that says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, having aught against mean, meanings there's something unsettled, they have something against you yet, or there's something holding the relationship back. So if you remember that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So he puts this process of reconciliation, one to the other, before worship even. The Maha Chohan said, many who come to our altars to worship the one true God and to learn that they may receive the Holy Spirit know not that they have lurking within the subconscious folds of memory, mind, and emotions through hereditary and environmental influences, jagged forms consisting of resentments and prejudices 
held against other parts of life? Do you have resentments right now that you're holding? The Mahachohan said, hardness and hatred, memories of injury and injustice, and all forms of selfishness prevent the reconciliation between brother and brother, and thus forestall the giving of the gift of self upon the altar of life. Only unconditional love and unconditional surrender can eradicate these foes of the righteous that prevent the flow of the Holy Spirit in the joint service of angels, elementals, and men. I trust then that in the days ahead you will pursue the total pur purification of consciousness, total purification of your consciousness, of my consciousness, of body, soul, and mind, he says, and your reconciliation with the flame in all mankind so that your striving to enter in may have its eternal reward. And he signs this message saying, I am thy comfort through all turbulence and travail and thy purity before the tyranny of tyrants, the Maha Chohan. He is the one that Jesus promised he would send. Jesus said, yes, I leave you now. I have to go on my, my, about my father's business, but there will be sent to you the one. And this one is the Mahachohan, is the Holy Spirit. So here we see the Mahachohan being the representative of the Holy Spirit, telling us that Jesus puts the Spirit and the reconciliation, the power of reconciliation, even before worship. Jesus says, truly those who make the greatest progress Godward are those who are aware of the importance of being their brother's keeper. And we offered this prayer earlier today, Decree 60.04, I am my brother's keeper. By contrast, how strange it seems that men would worship, would worship me without understanding my presence in all parts of life. For I am in the prisons in the marts of commerce, in the high noon of man's busyness. In the face of the child or the adult is the realization that I am come to the meek and lowly and to those who need the wholeness of the good physician. I came to set the captives free, and so shall it be both now and forever. In this world of delusion and despair, the multitudes wander upon the shores of life, that are strewn with the blasted hopes of yesterday. The few in every age who find the kingdom that is within feel their hearts swelling with joy as they discover their own life as a mission to uphold the faith and to bring my sheep into the fold of the Ascended Master's teachings. Greatly to be praised are the spirit of resurrection and those miracle hopes that each one must obtain for himself. Those who become good Samaritans and cosmic emissaries of our light merit not only our friendship and our love, but also our assistance in the darkening days that lie ahead while the new age is forming. These are the words of Jesus. In Mother's lecture was this, on the Sermon on the Mount, she says, Jesus lectures the scribes and Pharisees. He says, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, that is, good works, good karma. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things, bad works, bad karma. As the desire of the heart is, and as the intent of the soul is, so will the karma, or the acts, be. Next, Jesus sets forth a law that will not be broken. These are not the words of the Old Testament prophets and patriarchs. These are the words of our Lord Jesus. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof. In the day of judgment, 
For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So did Jesus say, but if you accept me as your Lord and Savior, I will neutralize this law? Mother says, show me in the New Testament where Jesus says that this statement is neutralized. He never neutralized it. It remains true to this very hour and this very day. And if we are accountable for every idle word that we speak, how much more are we accountable for every act and the state of our mind or our mindlessness that precedes the act or the desire that impels it? The law of karma gives us sound reason to control our tongues as well as our uncontrolled thoughts and feelings that propel our tongues, she says. Reading now from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Judgment of others forbidden. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with judgment. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of your eye. And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite. First, cast out the beam of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. And I, I read this in the scripture that comes from the St. James verse, versions because I like it, and I love it. And I love to have the sense of being one with the ancients as this was spoken, as it was taught. Going back to Emmett Fox, he says, in these five verses, we are told more about the nature of man and the meaning of life and the importance of conduct and the art of living and the secret of happiness and success and the way out of trouble and the approach to God and the emancipation of the soul and the salvation of the world than all the philosophers and the theologians and the savants have put together have told us, for it explains the great law, these five verses. It is, a vastly, more, it, it is vastly more important that a man and still more that a child should be taught the meaning of these five verses then he should learn anything else that is taught in our schools or our colleges. If the average man understood for a single moment the meaning of these words and really believed them to be true, he would immediately revolutionize his whole life from top to bottom. Turn his everyday conduct inside out and so change him that in a comparatively short space of time, his closest friends would hardly know him. And because the thing is infectious beyond computing, it would turn the world upside down for many, many others as well. The plain fact is, it is the law of life, that as we think and speak and act toward others, others think and speak and act toward us. Anything and everything that we do to others will sooner or later be done to us by someone somewhere. The good that we do to others, we shall receive back in like measure, and the evil that we do others, in like manner, we shall receive back too. This does not in the least mean that the same people whom we treat well or ill will be the actual ones to return the action. What does happen is that at some other time, or place often far away or long afterwards someone else who knows nothing whatever of the previous action will nevertheless repay it grain for aim grain for grain to us for every unkind word that you speak to or about another person 
an unkind word will be spoken to or of you. For every time you cheat, you will be cheated. For every time that you deceive, you will be deceived. For every lie that you utter, you will be lied to. For every time that you neglect a duty or evade a responsibility or misuse authority over other people, you are doing something for which you will inevitably have to pay by suffering a like injury yourself. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again, as the scripture says. My goodness, how many times have we heard this essential teaching? Do you think that we actually believe it? Do you actually believe it? Do you think our individual lives and our collective community lives would be the way they are if we really believed it? Inside your own heart and mind, do you truly, really believe this scripture? Do you think our leaders in church and in state are acting out of an awareness of this law? We are constantly in a state of initiating cause and reaping effects, constantly. We have been taught that we are in the best position our karma allows us to be in. Think about that. This is it. This is the best our karma allows for us to be in. So those things that we find so burdensome to us are what is due, and it's simply what's up for transmutation and transformation. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus states the mathematical precision of the law of karma. With what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now here's another example directly from Jesus, teaching the law of karmic retribution. The gospel records in the moment when Jesus is confronted in the garden by the Roman guards when he's being arrested. One of them, meaning one of the disciples, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then Jesus said unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And then Jesus touched the ear of the servant and healed him. Now we, we may think that it's wonderful that Jesus had compassion on the high priest's servant. But what about the disciple? What was the gift to the disciple? Because of this healing, the, the disciple would not have the karma of having to have his ear cut off at some future date. So this is a teaching that demonstrates reconciliation. Jesus comes to fulfill the law of Moses, and then he takes us to the next step. In essence, he is saying, the law cannot be broken, but it can be fulfilled through divine love. We know that we have to compensate for every fraction of the law, every jot and every tittle. And because we are moving toward our Christhood, that individual Christhood that Jesus came to demonstrate and leave a roadmap for us to accomplish it also. So here Jesus demonstrates to the guard who was struck and all those who observed it, the other guards and all those that were gathered around, including the disciples. He demonstrates a form of love that had not been demonstrated before. He demonstrated it for all to see. This is a lesson 
that our individual lives are to be the history of souls who didn't just balance our bad karma and sow some good karma. It shows that we must also bring home a harvest of souls as Jesus did. That's the part referred to as bringing generous blessings to all people in the Bible. To bring generous blessings to all people would mean that you would do what you could to prevent them from suffering the effects of their own negative karma, their own decisions that brought pain and suffering to you or others. Just as Jesus prevented the disciple from suffering the consequence of that action of harming the servant of the high priest. So you would provide opportunities for reconciliation and you would forgive 70 times 7 in order to alleviate their sufferings. This would be one way to bring generous blessings to all people. Jesus says, truly those who make the greatest pro- pro- the, who make the greatest progress Godward are those who are aware of the importance of being their brother's keeper. So I believe that holding the consciousness and awareness of being your brother's keeper and bringing generous blessings to all people means that you would always hold the intention of reconciliation, of being reconciled one with another. And this takes us back to what the Mahatohan said to us when he spoke of Jesus' teachings in Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24. In that brief teaching on Jesus' words, the Mahatohan is saying to us that reconciliation is our path. He is saying that reconciliation is being our brother's keeper. He is saying that we must pursue it even before worship. He is saying that we must pursue the total purification of consciousness, of body, soul, and mind. And he is saying that he, as the representative of the Holy Spirit, is our comfort through all of this turbulence and travail. Always there. The final verses of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 are these. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes, meaning the Pharisees. Emmett Fox makes this observation. In the concluding paragraph, we are told quite simply that people were astonished at his doctrine. It is always so. The Jesus Christ message is utterly revolutionary. It reverses all the standards and all the methods, not only of the world, but of all conventional or orthodox religion itself, for it turns our gaze from the outside to the inside and from man to his works to God. He taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. The greatest glory of obtaining the smallest true demonstration by means of prayer, of scientific prayer, you have experienced something that never leaves you. You have the witness of truth within yourself. You are no longer dependent upon the word of somebody else. You know for yourself that this is the only authority worth having. Jesus had this authority, and he proved it by doing the works. We who are the students of the Ascended Masters are the witnesses to the results of scientific prayer, aren't we? And we have had many small and large demonstrations of the power of the science of the spoken word. And we have literally sat at the feet of Jesus as one of the disciples precisely because the two witnesses our beloved Mark and Elizabeth Clare Prophet, have brought to us the lost teachings of Jesus and the presence of Jesus himself in dictations through the ages of the Holy Spirit. The Master has spoken directly to you and to me. Jesus contacted God directly, and he has taught us how to do it also. And therefore, when we speak, we speak the word of power, 
and we will reap the results. So as we go about the coming weeks, leading up to our celebration of the passion of our Lord, let us keep these three things in mind. Number one, I am my brother's keeper. Do your good deeds and then pass on, neither expecting nor wishing for personal recognition. Number two, remember the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In scientific Christianity, it might be stated this way. Think about others as you would wish them to think about you. And number three. Let us remember what the messenger has told us about the Sermon on the Mount. She told us to go home tonight and to burn the midnight oil, to read and study it with a new enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. This is the book of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7 in your Bible. It is Jesus' teachings on the consequences of thoughts, feelings, words, and deeds. And as Mother said, it's the greatest lesson on karma as the law of personal accountability for one's acts that you will find anywhere. And now as we prepare to receive Holy Communion, we're going to take a few moments of silence and to confess, to recognize and offer up for forgiveness those things that come to mind where you must might have transgressed against yourself, against your God, or against your neighbor. Let go of your sense of sin and the pain that comes with the memory of it. Tell it to Jesus right now. And then let go and move up higher. And of course, we know that confession should be a daily ritual for us in our private lives. But for today, in this service, we're going to just take a few moments of total si silence right now for your private prayers of confession, and then I will offer a prayer for all of us. So let us grow silent now and make your confessions in the silence. Please come back into the awareness of the present now. And let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus, come now. We are your own. Forgive us. Hear us. Hear our prayers and petitions to your sacred heart. O oh Jesus, we are ready. We are receptive. We are eager to go forth as the world teachers you and beloved Kathumi have called us to do. Forgive us for passing by those opportunities you created for us to speak, to act, to forgive others and ourselves. Forgive our nation for legalizing abortion and for all other offenses to our God above and to the God within us. Help us to teach the true story of the soul as the antidote to our sins. 
strengthen us in body, mind, and soul to move forward, forgiving the past and embracing the future that is ours to claim and to anchor in our beautiful planet Earth, right here, right now. Oh, Jesus, we ask these things in your name, your sacred name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand now as I invoke the blessing of beloved Jesus on our Holy Communion elements. Beloved Lord Jesus, we come now to partake of the ritual of Holy Communion. Beloved Jesus, stretch forth your hand and by your sacred heart, bless these elements representing the bread and the wine. Charge them with the spirit of Alpha, the matter of Omega with the Holy Ghost and with the spirit of the cosmic Christ. Let the essence of your Christhood flow to us now through the ritual of transubstantiation. As we prepare now to receive this most holy communion, your body and your blood, we seek your guidance and your encouragement each moment and in each encounter with all the souls we are meant to meet and to serve. Charge now these elements. Infuse them with the courage, the coming of age of our hearts, to stand, face, and conquer those portions of karma that are ours to transform, that karma that is built on desire. We are grateful for your teaching and for your offering of your body and your life to show us that we too can walk the path to the ascension. We are grateful to be among your army of Christian soldiers. Amen. Amen.